This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon! Melts in your mouth, not in your hand. So Nickelodeon has been going on for a few good years now, enough to imply that, while not yet the most successful thing in the world, it was at least here to stay for a little while longer. That meant that it was a stable platform, which meant that it had at least a little value to people and corporations outside of Warner Amex. Normally this would translate into purchasing commercial space, but Nickelodeon was a commercial free channel at the time, so that didn't happen. Then there's the interactions between the channel and celebrities. Nowadays, seeing a famous actor, pop star, or athlete on Nickelodeon is a regular thing, especially around events like the Kids' Choice Awards, which serves as a platform for cross-media promotion. Nickelodeon has the eyes of a young demographic, and if you're, say, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, you sure wouldn't mind endearing yourself to that demographic. And if you're Nickelodeon, you sure wouldn't mind getting Johnson's fanbase watching your channel. It's celebrity endorsement, and all the way back here in 1981, Nickelodeon was ready to create its first celebrity endorsement. The dearest it had gotten before this was Mike Nesmith, but his involvement was behind the scenes and by all accounts he didn't really get along with the station. No, we need someone we could put in the spotlight. Someone totally on board with what Nickelodeon was trying to accomplish. We may never have gotten to the Dwayne The Rock Johnson stage if we hadn't first had the Reggie Jackson stage. Indoors, outside, by land, sea, by air. Reggie helps you pick the sport that's best for you next time. It's the best of Reggie Jackson's world of sports. Sunday at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Reggie Jackson's world of sports premiered on Nickelodeon on December 1st, 1981. Airing on the weekends, hooray, we have enough programs to have weekend-only shows. World of Sports profiled youth sporting events from all across the country. Events like the Wolverine 3 International Youth Soccer Tournament, the National High School Rodeo Finals, and the AAU Junior Olympics. Along with these profiles, you would get discussions on fitness, things like exercise and diet. Essentially a show about motivating children into getting into sports. Hey, see all these cool young athletes? You could be just like them if you eat your celery and do jumping jacks. While not an outright exercise program, World of Sports came out at the cusp of an explosion in fitness media brought about by the expanded broadcast space of cable television and the growing home video market, the commercialization of fitness. 1981 was also the year that Jane Fonda workout premiered, a year prior Richard Simmons' syndicated television show made its debut, and a year after, the Disney corporations would get into the game with Mouser Size, which they turned into one of the launch programs for the Disney Channel in 1983. This was in conjuncture with the rise of cable sports programming. After all, it was boxing that had made HBO so appealing in the mid-70s. Cablevision launched what would later be called Sports Channel in 1976, the Madison Square Garden Sports Network, later rebranded to USA Network, premiered in 1977, and ESPN made its debut in 1979, the same year as Nickelodeon. And then, of course, there was lots of popular sports programming on network television. Monday Night Football was the 11th highest rated show in 1981. 1982 would see the Super Bowl hit a new record with over 85 million viewers. And there were legacy programs like Wide World of Sports, which the title, Reggie Jackson's World of Sports, clearly sprung from. IMDb even gives the incorrect title of Reggie Jackson's Wide World of Sports. So the creation of this show was pretty well timed, tapping into multiple rising markets and giving Nickelodeon something to appeal to a potential sports-loving kids audience. And of course, you have the show's host and star, Reggie Jackson. Then a 35-year-old on the tail end of his run with the New York Yankees, Reggie Jackson had become one of the most famous baseball players of his time, having won five World Series, three with the Oakland Athletics and two with the Yankees, most famously hitting three consecutive home runs in Game 6 of the 1977 World Series. His reputation for clutch hitting in the postseason had earned him the catchy nickname of Mr. October, and I kid you not, he made mustaches trendy among baseball players. There's an entire Wikipedia page on how Reggie Jackson paved the way for baseball mustaches. This combination of athletic achievement, nicknames, and facial hair made Reggie Jackson a very marketable sports star. 
I don't have exact numbers, numbers probably don't exist, but I would bet that Jackson was in more commercials than any of his baseball contemporaries. Fast food, cars, car stereos, home video equipment, video cameras, aftershave, toothpaste. There was Reggie Jackson branded baseball toys, and he even got his own candy bar. An outstanding World Series, three home runs in one game. Now that was a day I'll never forget, and it helped me to get my own candy hit. Reggie, with a rich caramel center, lots of fresh roasted peanuts, and a super chocolatey covering. Reggie, the candy they named after me. Mmm. Reggie, you taste pretty good. So even if you never watched baseball, Reggie Jackson was unavoidable in the 70s and early 80s, and would obviously be a major get as Nickelodeon's first true celebrity endorsement. And it might have been an appealing prospect for Jackson as well. This is all theorizing, mind you. There is virtually no behind-the-scenes information about this show, but remember how I said that this was the tail end of Jackson's career with the Yankees? Despite his success there, Jackson's relationship with the team had been very uneasy, with a lot of clashing egos, altercations, and contract disputes. Hell, even that popular nickname, Mr. October, was given to him by one of his teammates sarcastically, and it was only later reinvented as a celebrity nickname. Contract disputes meant Reggie Jackson was playing the 1981 season as a free agent, and it was a testy time to be a free agent, with baseball owners arguing that he should be compensated if a free agent player moved to a different team. This was considered contentious enough among players that beginning on June 12th, Major League Baseball went on a 49-day strike. Over 700 games were canceled, and players lost $4 million a week in salaries. So here's Reggie Jackson. The writing is up on the wall. He's not going to be with the Yankees next year. And also, he just lost a lot of money due to the strike. A side gig hosting a kid show might not be a bad idea. You know, let's not put all our eggs in one basket. Again, no way I can confirm this theory unless I somehow asked Reggie Jackson directly, and maybe it really was just as simple as Cy Schneider phoning up Jackson and saying, hey, let's make a TV show. But the timing of the strike versus the timing of the show's production does leave one curious. Also curious is the show's complete lack of footage. Remember that 15 second commercial at the beginning? That commercial is the only footage of Reggie Jackson's World of Sports. And I'm not just talking about YouTube. I have never seen this show being offered in tape trading circles or the bootleg DVD forums. It's not often mentioned in the classic Nickelodeon GeoCities websites of old. If somebody has this show in their possession, they're not offering it up. Any sports footage that I've been using, which are events featured on the Nickelodeon show, come from recordings of that event's actual live broadcast. Now, this isn't the first time we've dealt with having no footage, and it also won't be the last, but it feels weird for there to be no footage of this show specifically. Reggie Jackson's World of Sports ran for one 18-episode season, but reruns ran until 1985, well into the mainstream popularity of the VCR, and then would sporadically pop up again and again on special delivery. It was a trendy show for a targeted audience with a very popular celebrity host, it was designed to get eyes on it, but it didn't. And why is that? The conventional guess would be that there just weren't nearly as many sports-loving kids among Nickelodeon's viewership as there were, say, pop music-loving kids who latched onto things like pop clips and live wire on the concerts aired on Special Delivery. And as I talked about in my Special Delivery episode, Nickelodeon has always been uneasy bedfellows with sports never really committing to consistent sports programming, even when they had a spin-off channel about sports. And part of the reason for that is because, well, you don't really need kids-oriented sports programming. If a kid is interested in sports, they'll just, you know, watch sports. A baseball game is typically an all-ages event. But I think there's a more direct reason for World of Sports not resonating because it only had 18 episodes, but reruns ran once a week until 1985. That means that the show cycled through all of its episodes almost three times a year. Reruns of sports. That's only slightly better than reruns of the five o'clock news. And we're not talking highlights of important sports moments. We're not talking about Ken Burns documentaries. 
just general young adult sporting events from 1981 and 1982. I spent a good chunk of time poring over TV listings and managed to find synopses of 17 of the show's 18 episodes. A good chunk of the episodes featured different competitions of the same AAU USA Junior Olympics because getting four episodes out of one day's worth of shooting is just good business sense. Here's an episode on Boy Scout hiking. Sure, that's exercise, but I'd hardly call it a sport. And to top it all off, one of the show's 18 episodes is a best of episode. Is there anything more depressing than catching a rerun of a season one clip show? So really only 17 episodes of sports content, which is fine for the first time you watch it. There's bowling, tennis, hockey, there's definitely a variety here. But what happens when it's 1984 and you're bored on a Sunday afternoon flipping through the channels? Are you going to stop to watch the Texas High School Football Championship? No, because the game is already three years old and you've seen that episode five times already. It's lost its immediacy and relevancy, and now Nickelodeon isn't getting your viewership. Maybe your family finally got a VCR, but by that point, why bother recording the show? Some shows are just better fits for syndication, and Reggie Jackson's World of Sports might not have been a good fit. But on the other hand, I can kind of see why Nickelodeon would be hesitant to throw it out. It's Reggie Jackson, man. The channel's first celebrity endorsement. And for a time, their only celebrity endorsement. If that name attracts even a handful more subscribers every year, then it's worth keeping it on the schedule, even if nobody actually cares about the show itself. I wish I could watch this show. As antithetical as it was to reruns, it might actually have been good, and it certainly has some historical value as records of certain youth sporting events. Will we ever see an episode pop up someday? Maybe, but I wouldn't hold your breath. I've managed to find multiple episodes of Against the Odds, which is one of Nickelodeon's all-time bombs. If I can find episodes of that show, but not this one, there's a good chance Reggie Jackson's World of Sports is lost in the void. I don't know if that's a tragedy, but I'd love to find out. Nick, 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 Next time, we return to the world of PBS Imports, where very crappy puppets teach us about how not to be racist. Hmm. Today's shout-out goes to Kids Rule, Nickelodeon and Consumer Citizenship by Sarah Bennett Weiser. Not really a reference book, but one of the very few theory books that examine the relationship between the consumption of children's media and that impact on culture through the lens of Nickelodeon. Okay, so pretty much none of the books on Reggie Jackson I managed to get my hands on even referenced World of Sports in passing, so I gotta go to my when I don't have anything relevant for the video shoutouts pile. But this is a very interesting read, not just for Nickelodeon fans, but people interested in media theory in general. Again, if you're new here thanks to the AV Club article, a warm welcome. I hope you're liking what you see. And if you think you might want to support Knickknacks or any of my other projects, then consider donating to my Patreon. Patreon subscribers can get advertising space on specific videos, as well as early access. So if that sounds like it appeals to you, give it a look. Also, like, share, subscribe, hit that bell, follow me on Twitter, all that good stuff. Stay frosty, everyone. <laughs>